the law. What species do these Pacific Northwest woods hold evidence that's rarer than Bigfoot? A Seattle pilot. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to the 50th edition of Park Ridge Sports History. And before I begin, we are going to turn our attention today to one of my favorite subjects, the Seattle Pilots and their first and only year in the Major Leagues 1969. And of course, uh, before I get into the book, Ball Four, written, of course, by one of Bergen County's own, Jim Bowden. Of course, this is Ball Four plus Ball four, Five. We'll get into that also in a second. I do want to say this. I want to have a special shout out to the producer and editor of this show, Howard Fredericks, who's done has done a remarkable job fashioning this program. He just does an unbelievable job editing, editing some music, uh, and, and just making it look flashier. <laughs> Believe me, he does an A plus plus job. But I want to thank him and the Park Ridge family for allowing me to do this and come into your homes each week to talk nothing but sports and anything else that's usually on my mind. Today, I do want to focus on the great book, Ball Four, by Jim Bouton. And it is a semi-autobiography, but it's definitely a diary of his uh, year spent. Actually, it wasn't a full year, but it was his year spent with the Seattle Pilots organization. And it's not the first book of its kind. In fact, it's probably the most famous because there was a book that I also read, Jim Brosnan's 1962, The Longest Season. I actually read that one first. And I was not a big reader. And then uh, around seventh grade, to keep me out of trouble, my seventh grade teacher knew I loved sports. So she gave me the sports section every day. So I would concentrate reading the box scores, really learning some math that way. I'm no great mathematician, but my brother Jim taught me uh, how to figure out batting average, how to figure out slugging percentage, etc. And getting those box scores every day, either in baseball, basketball, football, uh, really led me to go from there to reading articles about the games, to reading columnists, then to reading stories about sports, and then everything uh, everything that I can get my hands on. If it has something to do with history, especially American history, something to do with sports, cartoons, I love it. And I do pick it up. And uh, I, I really have to thank my seventh grade teacher for really getting me into reading that way. That being said, and also my shout out to Howard, I want to talk about that Seattle pilot team, which has kind of has its own lore. And in fact, it even has, I, I know this, there's a Seattle pilot website that you can go to. Uh, I'm using today the baseball reference as, as a guide to all things. I have some baseball cards and I also have the ballpark uh, that they played in. And the interesting thing is it was called, <laughs> this team won 64 games and they actually had the Royals in their division with the White Sox and they only won 64 games that year. But this is, I'm going to give you the black and white of six. It's kind of cool to see the old ballparks in black and white. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to show this and I may be messing this up, but believe me, the architects did too, because when I was reading and doing some research on the ballpark, I found out that it was built the wrong way. In fact, Amos Six was a minor league baseball owner. He was a big brewery owner. He actually produced Rainier, named after the mountain, Rainier Brewing Company. And the ballpark, Six Stadium. <laughs> and believe me, there are many nights that <laughs> fans probably got sick watching the pilots play. But Amos Six, that's E-M-I-L-S-I-C-K, and then it was Six, Six Stadium. Anyway, his ballpark, ready for this? It was, the field alignment was southeast. Let me get, get a picture. I'm going to get the color one now for you. It was southeast home plate to center field, which results in difficulty or in difficult visibility conditions for the left side of the defense in the early evening hours. The recommended alignment is east to southeast, which is where we get the term of southsiders and portsiders for lefty baseball pitchers. So from day one, the pilots were not in good shape. 
anyway, just give a little background on this. They they needed they needed funding, so the owners of the pilots had to go to a former owner of the Indians for some cash, and he became part owner of the team. And of course, the name escapes me right now, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I wanted to get that's not really described in the book as much as really the players, the casting characters, because I think that ball four does read. I mean, just get this. It's uh, a great read. It's a fast read. It's diary form. It goes from, let's say his first days, Bouton's first days in spring training with the pilots and how he got on the team and uh, part of the expansion. He's let go by the Yankees. You know, Bouton, one thing you can say about Bouton is that he did have a promising career. In fact, he won 20 games, won a World Series game, was part of the Yankees 62-63, and I believe 64 team. And I think it was 64 where he basically blows his arm out. He's 4-15. and 15. But he wins 20. He beats, I believe, yeah, he, he does. He beats the Cardinals in a World Series game. And things seem to be on the up and up, and then arm troubles and really he spends the rest of his major league career with the Yankees trying to fix the arm. And of course they lose patience and it seems that Bouton is finished. And I really believe that ball four is really a story about a, a courageous man's ability not to give up. And he goes to Seattle, decides that he's done with the fastball because it hurts his arm. And he's going to go back to what he used to throw in high school, which was the knuckleball. And he actually has some success, although, and this is where the fun part of the book is, and this in many respects is similar to Jim Brosnan's book called The Longest Season, which I think was written in 62. It's very similar. The two writers, uh, Brosnan and Bowden, are kind of on the cusp. They're just holding for Bouton, really, literally, by his fingernails to a major league job. Same thing with Brosnan. Brosnan did have some success in the major leagues, similar to Bouton. I don't think he won 20 games, and I don't believe he ever got into a World Series or World Series like Bouton did, because he did shuffle time between the Cubs and the Cardinals, I believe. Anyway, really is a story of these guys and their locker room perspective of not only their place on the team, and of course, neither one is a superstar. And so often we read stories about the superstars or Hall of Famer and everybody's glad having hand in them and, you, you know, really rooting, tooting for them. These are the guys. And I think this is why it's such a, these are great books. You're reading from the perspective of a guy just hanging on. And of course, Brosnan and I do believe quits after the 62 season. And Brosnan is definitely like Bouton. He is the protagonist of the story. And of course, the antagonists are basically the managers and the coaches and the front office. For Bouton, well, for Brosnan, I know he has some, really some heated moments with Soli Hamas, who is his manager. And uh, he comments about Soli Hamas, his, his conduct, his personality, how he treats the ball players. And Bouton, of course, his two big pro, uh, antagonists are his manager, Joel Schultz, and Marvin Milks. Now, I do remember I have Marvin Milks here. I actually got a picture of Marvin Milks. The funny thing is with Milks is that he had a pretty interesting uh, sports career. He starts, I believe, in baseball, starts with the Cardinals, then goes to the Angels, and is the uh, general manager of the Triple A Seattle Angels in 68, and then becomes the general manager, I believe, of the Pilots. Now, this picture does not really, or this card does not really exist. Somebody had a brilliant idea and, you know, fix it up because this is a 1971 baseball card, Marvin Milk's. Uh, I don't believe, I know that Tops used to have pictures of the manager and the assistant coaches, they would have a you know, one card with them in, in four different boxes. And, but they, and they would even have the national league and American league president from year to year, but I never saw them do a general manager. So this is kind of cool. This is what milks looked like. The funny thing is milks and Bowden 
do not share anything in common, whether it's politics or it's the way that the ballpark is, or the ball team is organized or the way that it's run or the way that the players are treated or contract negotiations. Obviously, these two are pitted against one another, and it is interesting. Now, got to be honest with you, I don't always agree with Bouton and his uh, politics and or his position on certain things. Sometimes people would say that he's kind of sanctimonious, okay? I will tell you this, though. I've read this book for over 40 years annually, whether it's summer, winter, or fall, and even in the early spring. And I'm not saying I just uh, pick it up. There are some times where I just pick up a random day and read it uh, to have some fun and really get a good laugh. I will tell you this. For me, it's a belly laugher. I have hurt myself laughing at some of the episodes, and I've read them a number of times. And uh, it was really, I, I think the first time I read the book was I probably a, a sophomore in high school. I did not. The book actually came out in 1970, and I actually had the privilege of interviewing slash being interviewed by Jim Bouton for a position when he was in Teaneck and he had the baseball card slash bubblegum product that he was selling. He was looking for salesmen. I just went there. I had a job, but I had a day off and I called and I wanted to see whether he had any part time things. He said, come in. So I got an opportunity to really interview for an hour and talk to him. It was really great. And I kind of stayed a little bit. I saw him a couple of times. He kind of recalled me. I'm not saying he perfectly remembered, but I always remembered uh, my run-ins with, with or my conversations with Jim Bout. It was pretty fun. I mean, let's face it. You're a kid. You love talking to, let's say, celebrities and all the rest of it. And Bouton was a celebrity for a while there because he was on TV. He was uh, he had his own show, Ball Four, had maybe six, seven episodes. I think Ben Davidson was in it. So things were looking up for him. But getting back to Ball Four, it really is a book about this guy's struggle to stay in the major leagues. That's all he's concerned with. And it's a book about really his relationship with his family with the people he works with, you know, because we all think that ball players, yeah, they're all buddy buddies and stuff. This book really shows that ball players, it's just like the regular workforce. You have friends and you have maybe some enemies or some rivals on, on the work floor. Interestingly enough, what many people don't have to deal with is what ball players they could just be traded or let go at a moment's notice, and then there are so many things that go on. What do I do with my family, my kids, school, etc.? So, as a book, I think it does give fans a good perspective. Now, mind you, he was criticized for the book. People thought he took too many shots at some of the great players, that he divulged too many secrets in the locker room, that they should have stayed there. I get all that, but I really do believe that. Fans and the perspective that Bouton gives have a better appreciation for the ball player seeing it as a job and that you can understand maybe why players don't get as upset, it seems, when they lose because they're looking at it as a job or they look at, I got to go to work today. And maybe we can understand why maybe they might ignore you for an autograph as they're coming up to the plate because they're doing their job. Imagine if you were an accountant, especially during the IRS season, and people want to glad hand you and get your autograph. And meanwhile, you're trying to get out, you know, a dozen tax forms so they'll be on time for Uncle Sam so that your clients won't have to pay a penalty. So you can see sometimes how you have to disregard or ignore the public. Because it's a job. And I think that Bouton beautifully brings this about, especially when he talks about how he's spending time with his family. And then all of a sudden someone calls him from the locker room and says, hey, did you know that we were having an afternoon game today? And he's rolling around with his kids and says, no, I thought it was, you know, we have to be at the park five for a seven o'clock game. or something. No. And he's late and he has to pay a penalty, you know, give to the kangaroo court 
pay the uh, club a fine for not being on time and all the rest of it. So you can see how baseball, the job, infringes on his home life. And for all, I, I think it is just a real appreciation that these ball players do travel a lot. They're away from their families. It's a struggle sometimes. Sometimes they have bad days and it's in front of 50,000 fans. How would you like it? You, know, you strike out with the bases loaded in a pennant race and you're booed by your hometown fans of 50,000 because they came out to watch your team. How would you like to be booed at work? <laughs> because maybe you weren't able to close that one one deal that would have guaranteed your company like a, a billion dollar contract with Nike and you're booed by all the stockholders. <laughs> so you can understand the perspective of the ball player. They are human beings after all. They have their frailties, they have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, they have their good moments, they have their bad. They are human beings. And speaking of human beings, here's what that team looked like. And I even showed this. First of all, let's just talk about this. The pilots come in to the game of baseball, and I got to tell you something. They had, if you were a New York Yankee, you probably would have hated playing for them. Uh as some of them did, or you felt like somehow God just didn't love you because he persecuted you by sending you to the Seattle Pilots. Before I went on the broadcast, I quickly, I wanted to get the logo of the Pilots. I completely forgot. And then I'm drawing it. <laughs> and as I'm drawing it, I'm saying, even I have a better logo than the Pilots. The It's an ugly logo. It's ostentatious. It's gaudy. Every, it definitely is not the, you know, the, the D the iconic D of the Detroit Tigers or the interlocking NY of the New York Yankees or even that NY SF classic for the Giants and the Mets or that brilliant LA look or even the wishbone for the Reds. I mean, that's one ugly. And then they had the audacity to stick this logo minus the pilot uh, lettering on their uniforms. In fact, I'll show you. Here's one of the first guys that I found. And the uniform is gaudy, to say the least. Now, this is 1969 cards. Gary Bell is in an Indian uniform, so you know where he was playing in 1968. Uh, this is George Brunette. I actually tried to pick guys that Bouton focuses on in the story. George Brunette, if you've read the, uh, the book, he's got some classic stories about Brunette. And Brunette, boy, oh, boy, you talk about a nomadic career. He was up and down in the major leagues with many teams. I think he played 10 or 11 major league teams. Plus he played in the Mexican leagues. Uh, and Bouton has some great stories about George Brunette. And you can understand after the stories why this guy is well-traveled. But you can see that ugly pilot uniform uh, logo. And what makes it even worse is that ugly pilot hat. I can't even describe that. I, I guess what it was supposed to be was a captain's hat on a furry. I think that's what I read. And they stuck an ugly S up there. It's not even, you know, like a Times New Roman S or like the D is for the Tigers. It's just one ugly S. And there's a good picture of the Seattle Pilots baseball team. Now, I don't mind the sky blue, uh, blue undersleeves. They're not bad. But they were probably the first team that had as a combination blue and yellow. Now, you had the Giants, black and orange. Of course, the Dodgers, blue and white. Yankees, dark blue and white, kind of like the Tigers, etc. Tigers even had a little bit of striping in orange. Nobody had the blue and yellow. And outside the Oakland A's, under Charlie Finley's watch, and in Kansas City as well, nobody had gold like this team did on their uniform. And of course, the A's are really the trendsetters for everything uniforms in the 70s, where they go with the dark colored shirts uh, for home and road. Probably their ugliest uniforms, the A's, was their all white one, because it was a, a real bright white. It wasn't even like a white home uniform <laughs> that they had. But we're sticking here with the Pilots. The other thing I love about the Pirates, now mind you, they won 64 games. If you take a look at Larry Haney, you can understand why the team uh, had only 64 wins. Now, obviously, this picture was 
taken in 1969. It was taken backwards because Haney's catching theoretically with the wrong hand and that his throwing arm would be his left, which means that for the majority of right-handed hitters, every time he threw to second, the ball would be maybe clocking him in their ear. <laughs> But that is the case of the Pirates. Now, the man upstairs here, Jack O'Donoghue, he's got a classic story. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was O'Donoghue. They're on the flight, and it's very nerve-wracking. It's the white knuckler type of flight. I've been on one of those in my whole life. Not that I've been on a lot of planes. but And, you know, the plane is going up and down and up and down. And some of the players are praying for their safe landing and uh, Bouton decides he's going to kid with one of his uh, passengers, one of the players. And O'Donoghue gets up and basically threatens him with physical violence. And then after the plane gets out of problems, uh, he apologizes to Bouton. <laughs> Bouton was like, <laughs> oh, I know it word. I think he uses the quote that O'Donoghue was going to crush his spleen <laughs> if he didn't cut it out. And O'Donoghue says, hey, you know, Jim, you, you can kid a lot about a, a lot about a lot of things, but not about the big guy upstairs. <laughs> and Bowden says, boy, was I was the one who lucked out because I think that O'Donoghue would have indeed crushed my spleen. Now, the other guy, I hope you can see this. All right. That's Mike Keegan. He's another Yankee or ex-Yankee. And many of these players, I really believe what happened with Marvin Milks. Let me get back to Jim uh, Marvin Milks. I think when he was planning this team, he tried to take quite a few players from winning ball clubs. So he had Wayne Comer from Detroit, Ed Euler from Detroit. He had, of course, Bouton, Jack Aker, and several others from the Yankees. And I think what he was thinking was – if I can get enough players with kind of a pedigree for winning and not just winning, you know, 88 games, I'm talking about winning a championship. It might just rub off on my young players and other players that I've picked up from other teams that are basically learning the game and it never really worked at least that first year because they do go 64 and 98. I mean, to the further it, he picks up Don Mincher. Now, Mincher, I think, was playing with Washington at the time, but I, I believe he picked him up. And, of course, Mincher played in the 65 um, World Series for the Twins. Interesting thing, and it gets actually back to um, Mike Hegan. Here's a picture of, on the left-hand side here, that's Don Mincher, 1969, if you can see him right here. And, of course, this is Mike Hegan. Interesting thing about both players. Mike Higgins' father, Jim Higgins, was a pretty good defensive catcher for the Indians back in the 50s. Those two guys I brought up together because, actually, Mike Higgins was named to the All-Star team to play in Washington, D.C. in 1969. He gets hurt. <laughs> so the Pilots or baseball names another player to take his place from the Pilots, and that's Don Mincher. The funny thing is, Mincher never gets into the game. So if you take a look at that 69 All-Star game, it does have a representative from the Pilots, but he never entered the game. And it always made me think about Ed Cranepool, who actually is named to the 65 All-Star team in Minneapolis or Bloomington, and he never got into that game. And that would be his only All-Star uh, nomination. And it's a shame that he didn't get into the game. Cranepool was a classy player. But Mitcher, uh and Hegan, here's another thing that's kind of interesting. They would both go on to the Oakland A's and help that team win a World Series. In fact, Mincher goes to Oakland in 1971, and he plays with them. I believe he played. Let me just see. Pretty sure he played in the postseason for the A's. Yes, he does. He played in the World Series against Cincinnati. Actually went one for three. Actually, his his uh, three years in postseason, or his three times in postseason, he hit 160, had one homer, two RBIs, but he's got a ring with the Oakland A's. Mike Hegan 
would also, I believe, go to the A's because he was there in 1971, I do believe. And I just want to get this right. Hegan does play for the A's. Mike Hegan should be here. Uh, other guys that are on this team besides Gary Bell, who was Jim Bouton's roommate. They have a great story. Steve Barber, who actually Bouton eventually criticizes. Barber, like Bouton, has arm problems. In fact, Barber was involved in a no-hitter when he was with Baltimore. He didn't throw the whole game. I think there were four Baltimore pitchers who wound up pitching a no-hitter. Pardon me. Let me just get back. Hegan not only plays in 71 with Oakland, he plays on the 72 team and the 73 team, but gets traded to, I believe, the Yankees. I don't think he pl played in the World Series, though, for – yes, he does. He plays and is one for five. He actually played in six games. I didn't realize that. Probably came in as a late inning. So both Hegan and Mincher, both named to the all-star team in 69, both don't play. Hegan gets hurt. Mincher replaces him. Both play for the A's. And I think I showed you this. On that team, here's a great one. So here's, here's the thing. So there was some talent there that would be later developed by winning clubs. In other words, they are winning components, Mincher and Hegan, to the A's. So obviously, I'm not saying you're going to build a winner using them as full-time players, but they were definitely good bench players to have on your team. How do I know it? Well, the A's picked them up and won a couple World Series with those two players. This picture is kind of cool because it's probably the only one with the Seattle Pilots where they have a leader in any stat, and that's Tommy Harper. And the interesting thing is, Harper has a great season in 69, leads the team in steals, but isn't named to the all-star team. He actually gets named as a brewer. And his 1970 appearance at Riverfront is the, is the uh, player that's gunned down by Johnny Bench attempting to steal second base. That's, that's Tommy Harper. Interestingly enough, because we've talked about Harper, he is a former Red being gunned down by a Red in the Reds' ballpark. All right, so that's Tommy Harper. Underneath that, that's Campy Campanaris and Cesar Tovar, who were one, two, and three then in the stolen base leaders. So at least Seattle, and you can see that ugly hat that the pilots had. At least they had a stolen base leader uh, in their franchise one year in history. The player over here is, I, I also picked them up. You can see that it's at, that happens to be Mike Marshall. Now, I did get a picture of Marshall. Marshall's kind of an interesting guy because uh, Jim Bouton was talking about players and the kind of inane idiocy or kind of lack of understanding that general managers in the front offices have. Because there was an episode where Marshall apparently was from Toledo, Ohio. And he was playing for Detroit. But instead of sending him down to the minor leagues to be closer to home in Toledo because he was being demoted, they sent him elsewhere. And a guy that could have been playing where Marshall was, they sent to Toledo. And the whole premise is that Bouton says, I just wish the owners and the people in charge would take into consideration, you know what, maybe they should investigate maybe the backgrounds. And maybe if they're sending these guys down to get them more experience or to give them some confidence, maybe if they send them to their hometown, this is Bounton's premise, that maybe they, uh, they would give the hometown a charge, maybe boost attendance, but also maybe a little bit of home cooking might be just all that they need to get their confidence back, their fastball five miles an hour faster, their screwball to, uh, to break more, etc. And that was his whole premise. And of course, Marshall is one of those guys that is described as kind of a radical pitcher, unorthodox, kind of a maverick in his career. He is a Cy Young Award winner, and he has some really good seasons with both LA, Montreal, and Minnesota. But unfortunately, and this is what Bouton's premise also about Marshall is, 
because he thinks outside the box. Uh, he was seen as weird, different, unorthodox. And probably his career is probably shortened by the fact that he wasn't going to roll with what everyone else was doing. And you got to remember, maybe Marshall had something to that because he does have a, a video out. He does have a, a pitching camp where he teaches the whole art of pitching in a different way, a different form. And he actually got one of those guys into the major leagues with Tampa Bay. Can't remember what his name was, but I saw the video. And it's very uh, strange pitching motion or different from the norm that we have today or that Marshall was taught. And it was Marshall. Actually, he also makes a statement in the book. Uh, Bouton does. He, he seems to like Marshall a lot because he seems uh, that Marshall seems to be very um, – Erudite. He seems to look at the game from a scientific uh, standpoint and from a logical standpoint. And I think that Marshall was a, a mathematics major when he was at Michigan State. And I think he even get. I know he has a PhD in some. Um, I think in li ligaments or muscles. The way the muscles. Really a smart guy, and but it wasn't baseball smart. That's Bouton's point, and that probably Bouton said Marshall probably got himself in trouble by kind of being smarter than the guys in charge of him. That was the point. But Marshall was interesting in that. You got to remember, too, Marshall in 1974, he gets traded for Willie Davis, goes to the L.A. Dodgers. He basically, along with Jimmy Wynn, kind of puts the Dodgers over the top, and they win the division over the Reds. But Marshall appeared in over 100 games in 1974, unheard of. And he had a ton of saves. I think he was 12 and 8, ERA about 2 6, maybe even lower. And he wins the Cy Young. And I'm not saying he had any great seasons that match that, but uh, he would leave the Dodgers and then save, I think, like 40 games for a couple of years with the Minnesota Twins playing for Gene Mock. Interestingly enough, I don't think he ever had a problem with Walter Alston. I don't think he ever had a problem with Gene Mock. But it seemed to be uh, the mediocre managers, unfortunately, like Joel Schultz, it seemed that he had problems with. And I think because he liked to do things the Marshall way. I, obviously, here's Joel Schultz over here. And uh, Schultz, interesting. He is seen definitely as an antagonist. If you were to set this up as a, a stage show, obviously, Bouton would be uh, the protagonist, Marvin Milks, and Joe Schultz would be the antagonist, along with Sal Magley. And the interesting thing is, I always remember what he said. Magley was one of his favorite players when he was growing up. And I remember Bouton grew up in New Jersey and also in Illinois. He was a huge Giant fan. He talks about in the book, Ball Four, how he finally faced his, his favorite player, Willie Mays. But that Magley was also one of his special players. And it's interesting because he's so disappointed in finally meeting Magley, and I guess maybe the, the the shine is taken out of the armor of this great night on the mound for Bouton, and it is kind of and, and it, it's a it's a great uh, great story about really we shouldn't worship our heroes, and sometimes maybe it's better that we don't meet our heroes and become disappointed. Really, really interesting stuff on that. Other guys on this team, as we head on down, we got a few, a few more minutes. I already showed you this. Um, Greg Gossin. Now, he's one of the, what they would consider then, flakes on the team. He grew his hair real long. Greg Gossin, of course, it, he's famous for the quip by uh, Casey Stengel, and I think that Bouton brings it up in the book, that Casey said something like, yeah, today – Greg Gossin is 25, and in five years, he has a chance to be 30 years old. But Gossin actually has uh, the distinction, even though it really doesn't count. He has the distinction because Bouton brings it up as being baseball's first designated hitter, albeit in a practice game, exhibition game, but it is Greg Gossin, or Goosen, as you may, uh, who is the... Uh, uh, first DH in the history of baseball. And actually, uh, Bouton opines about 
the uh, DH. Not long. He gives it a couple of paragraphs, and I always felt he was kind of against it, even though he said, I'm a rotten hitter, and he was never a good hitter. And um, just I I interesting, his whole uh, take on that. Then there was another player, of course, Diego Segui. And I do believe Segui is also a guy who goes to Oakland. It seemed like they did a ton of trades. Uh, he actually leads the major leagues in losses in 1964 with 17. But then he is traded to Oakland. And in two years <coughs> with Oakland, he has a uh, ERA in two full seasons with Oakland. where it's about 2.85. But the big thing is he leads the league in ERA in 1970 with a 2.56 ERA. He pitched the minimum number of innings, 162. He went 10 and 10, Diego Sigue, right up here. Uh, and he had two saves, but he led the league in ERA, 2.56. I think he most benefited from the fact that he was working with Catfish Hunter. I think they also had a guy named Pat Dobson on that 70 team. And the fact that Oakland Alameda County Stadium is a cow pasture. Actually, it's not a cow pasture. It's a cattle ranch of foul territory. So he de definitely benefits. Actually, he wasn't that bad. He wound up with uh, a 381 ERA, 92 wins, 111 losses. Probably his best seasons come in Oakland. Uh, Diego Segui. So he leads the league in ERA. Just another guy, but not with the, the pilots. And then a couple others as we go. Joel Schultz is kind of interesting. You know, I wanted to bring this up. He has a, a, a favorite saying that, that the players use and that he uses. And I think what makes Schultz so, so fun, he seemed like a good guy. And he came from the Cardinal organization. He was part of the Cardinals pennant winners and World Series championship. Uh, to be honest with you, Joel Schultz was 64 and 98. I think he was just a mediocre manager. Uh, yeah, he actually only managed 191 games, 78 and 112 for his career. And uh, he took over the Tigers in 1973 and was 14 and 14. So those are his t only two. But he basically was in the Cardinal chain. And when he retired, finally, he, like Stan Musial, I think both acquired from the Bushes their own beer uh, distribution. So they probably drove the beer trucks, delivered the beer, uh, the beer, and also owned their uh, own uh, distributorship. And for uh, Maris, I think he made a ton of money doing that, probably more money than he did earn in the major leagues at the time. Other guys on this team, I'd mentioned Gary Bell. He was the roommate. It's a great – I should do a trivia book on this. Uh, he was one of the roommates for Jim Bouton. And down here you have Roland Sheldon. Doesn't really talk about him too much or Rich Rollins. Mincher, though, he talks about his southern accent and that uh, it seemed to bother him. And that he had his – and this was pretty good. So Bouton – again, shows that he has his own prejudice, his regional prejudice, him being from the Northeast and, of course, the Midwest. He has his own accent, obviously. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Jersey accents are thick. But he talks about Mincher and the immediate feeling he felt when he heard his Southern, because Mincher, I think, was from Alabama originally, but he heard a very thick Southern accent, was that he was not going to like Mincher and that immediately he thought he was dumb. But as the book progresses, he does seem to have a pretty good relationship with Mincher. Not that they become roommates or best friends, but he comes to respect Mincher. And that his own preconceived notions, prejudices, and bias were wrong. So in that respect, uh, Bouton really has an epiphany about other players. And he comes kind of off his snob... Uh, kind of his, sn his snobbish ladder and comes down and is able to celebrate all the players on the team. Uh, I don't know what to celebrate. You only won 64 games, obviously. But uh, um, he does come to respect 
all the players on the team. Just another couple of things before I go. He had some great quotes in this, and of course, I think he has one of the best quotes of any book in American literature. I would, I would put it up there with uh, the end of Huckleberry Finn and probably some other classics. Uh, but he says this, not the end of the book. These are some of his better quotes. The older they get, the better they were when they were younger. And he's talking about how players, the older players, see the younger players. And we do it all the time, too. We're watching players, and we'll watch them today and say, these guys, ah, they're making so many fundamental mistakes. They strike out too much. They do this. They do this all wrong. You know, back in the day, we, we, we. And then you start to realize you got to kind of catch yourself and start to say, wow, I'm just as bad as, let's say, my grandfather or my father talking about the players of his time or when he was growing up. The players today are definitely faster. They're definitely stronger. They're definitely better athletes. They'll be better at that 20 years as the game evolves and develops and really refines itself. I think what, play, what many fans have a problem with is just too many strikeouts today and not enough action. We can save that for another day. But the fact is that we always look at our generation as the elite. And it is a universal theme that we always look at the universal, at the previous one. Last thing, best line. You spend a good piece of your life ripping a baseball. And in the end, it turns out that it was the other way around all the time. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports. Thanking you for joining us again as we relive the 1969 Seattle Pilots and Jim Bowden's ball for